Bleh. I think it would be fair to say that I don't really know how to do an intro. I hope that you are well and kicking it fine. Today we are going to learn about the murder of eight-year-old Maddie Clifton. Before we begin, I just want to take a moment to offer my sincerest sympathy to Maddie's family. They're out there living their lives without their little girl because of some sick freak decided to take her away from them and it's not okay. It's not fair and it's time that we hear their side of the story. I actually gathered most of my research about this case through watching other YouTubers talk about it, hearing about podcasts and even some TikTok threads. The coverage of this case online is so low, it's actually astonishing. And it's actually really sad that Maddie's side of the story has been silenced for so long. Because of this, I feel like it's important to start off this new side of my channel by talking about Maddie's case because I want to be part of the community that is telling her side of the story. Her murderer is called Josh Phillips and annoyingly if you google Maddie Clifton you're ambushed by pictures of Josh Phillips and actually annoyingly his Wikipedia page. Like Maddie doesn't even have a Wikipedia page. A major misconception about this case is what Josh said actually happened, but we'll get to that in a minute. But what I will say right now is that Josh has claimed that he had to take precautions to silence Maddie because he knew that if his dad found out there was a girl at their house, he would be pissed. Because strangely enough, Josh's dad had something against little girls being in the household. Even Josh's mom thought that it was a bit weird that his dad had something against little girls. Like he didn't like them, he didn't want them around. And this might seem like I'm really reaching at this point but you can't deny that it gives some cause for concern that Josh's dad might have known that Josh could have been dangerous to little girls. However there are details about this case that just lead you to believe there's no way that it was an accident. I strongly believe that Josh was a predator and unfortunately Maddie was his prey. This was a premeditated attack that unfortunately seemed to be a long time coming. And I don't mean to harp on about this Wikipedia issue, but even the second line just begins to excuse why Josh did what he did. It talks about his dad being an alcoholic, a drug abuser, he used to beat Josh and his mom. And I feel like that just sets the tone for the rest of the Wikipedia article that you're instantly just going to think this poor boy Josh did what he did because he's a product of this mistreatment in his household. Like, no, it doesn't work like that. So I keep rambling on before I kick into the story, so let's just start. Our story starts on November 3rd, 1998 in Jacksonville, Florida. Maddie was the daughter of Steve and Sheila Clifton and she had an older sister, Jessie. She was just like any other little girl and she was adorable. It said that Maddie was a really polite little girl. She was into a lot of different things. She could easily switch from being into princesses and being into more tomboy kind of stuff. And she liked playing outside with her friends and that's exactly what she was doing the day that shit hit the fan. Maddie had been playing outside with her friends, hitting golf balls towards a fence. And a little bit later on, she came back inside the house to ask her mum if there was any more golf balls because they ran out. Her mum responded, no, there aren't any here, but I'm sure if you go back outside and look for some, then you might find some. So Maddie was like, okay, I'll go look. And she left, and that is the last time that Sheila Clifton ever spoke to her daughter. I just want to mention at this point that Maddie and her older sister Jessie have been warned by their grandmother to not speak to Josh Phillips. He'd said some things to them that just wasn't right and they told their grandma about it. He told the girls that he knew how to wear a condom and he knew how to have sex without getting a girl pregnant and he'd actually at one point shown them a porno magazine. I just personally feel like straight off the bat he was trying to exploit these girls and introduce them to a part of the world that it wasn't his responsibility to do. In 1998, Josh was 14, so he was considerably older than the girls, especially Maddie. And I don't know about you, but when I was 14, I didn't want to hang out with eight year olds like Maddie or 11 year olds like Jesse, and vice versa, the girls most likely didn't want to hang out with a boy who was older and especially one who was saying some weird shit. However, Josh did say that he was out playing with Maddie when he accidentally hurt her and I don't believe that's true. If Maddie knew that Josh was a bit weird and she went so far to go and tell her grandma about it, then why would she welcome him to come and play outside with her? It just doesn't add up. She was already cautious about him. And also as well, just really quick, I just want to add, when the search began for Maddie that evening, her mum actually went to another house where another little boy lived to see whether Maddie was playing with that little boy. She didn't even go to Josh's house right away. That was like one of the last resorts. So that just goes to show how little Maddie and Josh were considered friends. Like, 
they just weren't friends. Later on when Jessie returned home, their mom asked if she knew where Maddie was. I don't actually know where Jessie was at the time that Maddie disappeared, but my best guess is that she was hanging out with kids at her own age. When they realised that Maddie was missing, Sheila and Jesse went door to door looking for Maddie. It seems as though they were actually from a nice neighbourhood because soon enough the entire neighbourhood was out looking for Maddie. Part of that makes this case all the more heartbreaking. Like Maddie's family had set up this new life for themselves in a nice neighbourhood. They thought like they were just going to raise the kids there and everything would just be sweet. Something that pisses me off is that even Josh came out to help search for Maddie. This happens in so many cases. When people go missing, you'll find that the person responsible for that is actually in the middle of the whole fiasco, the middle of the search party, acting like they care, just trying to blend in. Of course, Maddie's mum contacted the police on the evening of November 3rd, 1998, when she's exhausted the search around neighbours' houses and she realised that she wasn't just playing with a nearby child. The whole of Florida was looking for Maddie, which is kind of touching because it makes you realise in moments of crisis people can come together with the shared interest of bringing this little girl home and hoping that she's safe. Now at this point before we continue with the story I just want to let you know what Josh's side of the story is. Josh said that he and Maddie were playing in Josh's backyard when he accidentally hit her in the face with a baseball. Maddie was bleeding and crying and he started to panic and he just wanted her to stop crying. Because Josh's dad was so abusive and Josh knew that his dad would flip if he knew that there was a girl at the house Josh then decided to continue beating Maddie with the baseball bat until she stopped crying. He then dragged her from the backyard through the house to a bedroom. He removed the side panel of his bed frame and he stuffed Maddie in there. Trigger warning. When Maddie was found, her shorts and underwear were removed. Josh claims that this happened when he was dragging her across the floor, which I find strange because her socks and shoes were still on. These items of clothing were obviously purposefully removed and I shudder to think what this boy did to this little girl. Perhaps that saves the family some more trauma that Josh never told the truth about that. There's something else that I need to mention that just points the finger that Josh executed a planned attack. A few days before Maddie's disappearance there were multiple break-ins to the Clifton household and while it's said that only a few strange things were missing after the break-ins, like a staple gun was missing, there was also a picture taken from the household of Maddie's older sister Jessie doing gymnastics in a leotard. Other than that, some things were just out of place. Maddie's dad Steve noticed that there were some pry marks on the windows, so he knew that someone had actually broken into the house. However, because nothing major was taken or broken, he just assumed that it was a kid that came into the house and he just left it at that. I have no idea why he thought that that was okay and just overlooked that, but I don't know. There you go. However, because of this and because of the things that Josh had said to Maddie and Jesse that were a little bit strange, Maddie's dad, Steve, became a little bit more suspicious about Josh's involvement in Maddie's disappearance. Steve went so far to suggest to the police that they should go and check out Josh's house. So on November 6th, three days after Maddie went missing, the police went to the Phillips household and interviewed Josh. But sadly, Maddie wasn't found until days later. Something else that just shows how messed up Josh is, like, as if we didn't know already. He had his interview with the police while he was sat on his bed. That means that detectives were in the same room as Maddie's body days before she was even found. You can't deny that just makes you wonder just how psychotic Josh is. Like, why sit there? Like, what's wrong with the couch or like the kitchen table? Like, come on, like, now, like I was, you're probably wondering why detectives couldn't smell the body. From my personal knowledge of watching CSI and Criminal Minds, bodies do tend to decompose quite quickly and she had been missing for three days. The detective who interviewed Josh was asked if he could not smell the body decomposing in the room and he did say that there was a strong smell in the room. However, there was also a dog cage and a bird cage, both filled with feces. So he put the smell down to that. And I think that just further illustrates the kind of person that Josh is. Like that made me feel sick. That to me is animal abuse. It just shows that he doesn't have any remorse or empathy. November 10th, seven days after Maddie's disappearance. Melissa Phillips, Josh's mom, decided to tackle trying to clean her teenage son's room. Josh was in school at this point, so she probably thought that it was best to go in then when he wasn't in the way. While she was in there cleaning Josh's room, she noticed that his water mattress was leaking. While she was trying to find the source of the leak, she removed part of the bed frame. It was at this point that she saw something white and she started pulling on it only to find that it was one of Maddie Clifton's socks. Maddie Clifton's body was found under Josh Phillips's bed by his own mother. 
Some light in this story is that Josh's mum did the right thing. She went straight outside to the police and she told them that she found Maddie's remains. She has said in the past that as she walked outside, there was a fleeting moment when she knew that the Clifton family's lives were never going to be the same as soon as she told the police this news. I can't even imagine going through that trauma and there's always something in stories like this that makes you say, oh, that would make it so much worse. But imagine searching tirelessly for your little girl for seven days only to find out that some fucking prick across the street has known exactly where she is this whole time. I just want to point out here as well that despite Josh's story of only beating Maddie with a baseball bat, Maddie's body was sadly found with 11 stab wounds which Josh's story does not account for. Now at this point Josh was in school so the police went down to his school and he was arrested there. He was trialled at age 14 as an adult and he was convicted of first degree murder. In 2002 Josh appealed his case saying something about he's a teenager and he's only just realised that he's going to spend the rest of his life in prison. Like the fucking audacity. Maddie's life was literally taken from her by this person and he thinks that now he's got the ability to say what he should do with the rest of his life or how he should spend the rest of his life. Like fucking no, stay in your lane. Like Anyway, some good news was that this appeal was denied and in 2017 Josh appealed his case again and was again denied. However, a lot of new evidence did come about in this 2017 case that just confirmed that the state does not believe Josh's story at all. The state also confirmed that they believe that Josh led Lord. I don't know how to say that word. I'm gonna write it here. Laird. Maddie into his house, which I agree with. Trigger warning. It was said that Josh's story of how Maddie's pants and underwear had fallen off just didn't make sense. And on top of that, there was no drag marks or dirt or anything on Maddie's body that would indicate that she'd been dragged across the floor. Josh himself also added more brutal information to the case than what he did when he was 14 years old. Josh said that once he brought Maddie inside, he continued to beat her over the head with a baseball bat as well as attempting to strangle her with a telephone cord. Specialists have said that Maddie would have died within half an hour of being placed under Josh's bed frame. However, Josh did say that Maddie was making too much noise, so he had to take her out of the bed frame and stab her twice in the throat. He then replaced her back under the bed, went to the family bathroom to clean himself up, and as he left the bathroom, he heard Maddie crying again. So he went back to his room, took her out from under the bed again and stabbed her another nine times. After this, Josh actually found the time to go out and have dinner with his family and later on help the neighbourhood search for Maddie. And I actually found out, trigger warning, from a TikTok, Josh found the time to watch porn that evening while Maddie's lifeless body lay in his bed frame. As we know at this point, Josh went on to keep Maddie's body under his bed frame for seven days and just slept in that room like nothing was amiss. This man is all kinds of fucked up and Josh has never admitted to this. However, specialists claimed that this was a sexually motivated crime, which I agree with. By the way, you can watch the whole of Josh's 2017 sentence and rehearing on Facebook and YouTube. I just want to run back to something here. Remember when I said that the Clifton household had been broken into a few times before Maddie's disappearance and that picture of Jesse in a leotard doing gymnastics was stolen? Guess where that picture was found? You got it. It was on Josh's fucking bedside table. This just paints a whole ass picture of what Josh's family life was like. Either his family just didn't care enough to go into his room or they did go into his room and they just had this whole knowledge that the son was collecting family pictures from the fucking neighbor's house. This also confirms even more that this was a targeted, sexually driven attack. Josh had approached the Clifton girls multiple times, told them disturbing things, shown them disturbing things plenty of times before this had even happened. But as always, it gets worse. Josh actually kept one of the missing posters for Maddie, not too far from the picture of Jesse in his bedroom. He had that poster propped up in his room, feet away from the body of the person that the poster was for. It's like he thinks of it as like a trophy or something of what he's done. Like you'd have to admit he's showing some kind of pride here. After seven days of being missing, Maddie's body was sadly fairly decomposed by the time she was found and sadly her family couldn't have a traditional open casket funeral. Maddie's dad Steve has actually spoken in the past about how this made him feel like he didn't actually get a chance to say goodbye to his daughter and he's lacking closure because of that, which is just heartbreaking. At this point, I'm just reflecting on the fact that Josh has already taken so much away from this family and because he was just selfish and just sick in the head, he didn't even have the decency to let the family have a proper goodbye. Despite the state not believing Josh and Josh still being in prison, I still feel like his story is bought by the masses and that's down to the fact that there's no narrative of what actually happened to Maddie because Josh is always stuck with this story that he gave in 1998 that he accidentally hurt her 
and he was just afraid of being caught and being told off. I don't know why this has been overlooked. I don't even know whether any alternative narrative has ever been offered to Maddie's family. However, this is the reason why I wanted to tell Maddie's story to kick off this true crime area of my channel because I wanted to stand out. Maddie was robbed of her life and robbed of her truth. And now because Josh is still alive and still trying to worm his way out of prison as recently as four years ago, people just seem to be a little bit more interested in him rather than they are about Maddie herself and that's just not okay. During Josh's retrial in 2017, Maddie's mum gave a statement part of which I'm going to directly quote now and trigger warning because this is really heartbreaking. The defendant, through this brutal murder of Maddie, robbed her of her chances to go to school to fall in love, to get married, to have children, my grandchildren. I often wonder what her life would have been like. The defendant now wants a second chance to live a normal life. Who does Maddie get to appeal her death sentence to? Although that is upsetting to hear, her mother's put that into the best words to illustrate the pain that Josh has unnecessarily caused. Maddie Clifton was a sweet, honest little girl. She liked to have fun, she liked to play with her friends, she loved her family and she deserves to be alive today. For the evidence in this story and the sheer fact that a little girl lost her life to Josh Phillips, I strongly believe that he deserves to be in prison for the rest of his life and shortly after, burning in hell for all eternity. Best in peace to Maddie Clifton and again I want to offer my sincere sympathy to her family and friends. I hope that if anybody from Maddie's life comes across this video they'll know that it was made with the purpose of speaking Maddie's truth and not Josh's excuse. So that was something a little bit different from me. Please let me know if you like this video by liking Duh. Subscribe if you want to see more like this. Let me know in the comments if there's any other information that you have about Maddie's case that you feel I missed out. Please comment below of any other cases that you think are quite interesting and you would like me to talk about. I spent a hot minute gathering research about this case because I, as I say there's not a lot about this case online so if you could show some love I would really appreciate it and I hope that you're ready to embark on this journey of true crime stories with me. For now have a great year. Be safe and fuck Josh Phillips. Bye!